Thanks, Rachel. I tried a new hat on last week. Worship didn't work so well. <laughs> and self-fired myself. Uh, anyway, welcome. Uh, summer continues, so all of us summer buffs, we have another day at least. I hear the week's supposed to be good, and so here we go. Um, if uh, we haven't met, my name's Robin. I'm one of the pastors here, and like Rachel said, I'd love to meet you. I usually hang out in the atrium after the gathering, so please come by and just say hi and introduce yourself. I can't promise to remember your name the first time, so give me like two, three you know, introductions, and then hopefully uh, I'll remember your name, but I just love to meet new people. If you saw the social media post on Friday or Saturday from Lakeside, you'll know that I said that there's a question that's been haunting me for about 10 years. And when I say haunted, I mean haunted. Like it's harassed, it's harangued, it's harried, it's, you know, all the H. Wasn't that good? That was pretty good. Um, anyway, it's haunted me for 10 years. And I think you probably have questions like that too. Questions that sort of play in the back of your mind. They come up from time to time and you just, you just wonder about them. And maybe it's because of my vocation or my passion, but I've been haunted by this one question. If churches closed, who would miss us? If church is closed, who would miss us? We would miss being together and gathering, maybe, although COVID tested that theory, right? Many of us didn't miss gathering. Many of us didn't miss singing worship songs on Sunday because we could just put our playlist in and sing at the top of our lungs in our car. We didn't miss the teaching necessarily because you can get anything you want online now. We didn't miss rushing the kids to get them out the door and make sure both of their shoes are on. We didn't miss volunteering because who of us needs one more thing to do in the week? And outside of these walls though, outside of these walls, who would miss us? If Guelph Hospital closed, wow, we would notice. That would be missed. If Hope House closed, there'd be a lot of people that missed that. If garbage collection stopped, well, <laughs> we'd all miss that. And if Tim Hortons closed, well, well, like, we might as well close Canada. <laughs> like, what's the point, right? Now that I've convinced you all that, you know, this isn't worth it, <laughs> please hang in with me, because we are in a new series, Restoration, and I just, I'm excited about it. It's kicking off the entire year, so hang in with me, and uh, we'll see why this is all worth it, why we do this. But it does beg the other question, right? Why do we do what we do? What are we doing when we gather like this, whether it's online or in the room? What does it mean to be the church? And I say be the church because it's be the church, not come to church. And language matters, right? Church is not something we come to. Church is who we are. But what is the point of it all? And maybe you've never asked yourself that. Or maybe you keep asking yourself that. Or maybe your kids are asking you that or your neighbors or your relatives, why do you do this thing? Well, in July of 2021, uh, the staff and the elders, we met together for a, like a one day retreat. And basically we met to ask this question, to pray and to dream about who God is calling us to be. <clears throat> Specifically, here at Lakeside, in this time and in this place. Why should we do this? Why should we continue? It wasn't about asking God, what do you want us to do? But God, who do you want us to be? Because our doing comes out of our being. We start with being, and then our doing fo follows that. And after a day of praying and listening and drawing, we had, we had chart paper all over the walls, we broke out into small groups, we prayed, we listened, we, we brainstormed. After a day of doing that, we sort of distilled everything that we brought, that we heard, that we thought into what we called a five-year dream. This, these were our aspirations. They're not new. If you've been hanging around Lakeside for a while, you've heard of them. But it's what we felt God was drawing us or inviting us to as a church. And the first one was presence, right? We want to create a space and a place where people can experience the presence of God. And the next one was becoming. Together, we want to strive to become more and more like Jesus, orienting our lives around the Jesus way, which is so countercultural to the world's way. 
And then there was deep faith wide embrace. You'll recognize that if you've been here for a while, where we dig deep into our faith and into the tough questions that we often have, unafraid to wrestle with scripture, with God, with faith, choosing to gather and to love each other, even though we might have huge differences of opinion. And as our faith deepens, our table gets bigger, less exclusive, more diverse. And then we said oasis. We felt God was calling us to create a space and be a people of oasis, where it's a safe place to be transparent and vulnerable, where it's okay to not be okay. And then lastly, we thought God is calling us to be restorers, to be engaged in restoration, which is just our word for mission. It's just mission kind of has a bit of a bit of baggage attached to it, but, but to be restorers. And we see this theme throughout scripture, to, to reimagine life as God intended, to, to recover Jesus' vision for the church, and to repair the brokenness around us, whether it's in ourselves or where we meet it. And this isn't going to be a project, like a five-year project, and then we're done. We'll never, <laughs> we'll never be complete in this project, but it's a dream. We, for five years, we're just going to focus intently on these five aspirations, Two years ago, we looked at deep faith, wide embrace, what it meant to be Jesus-centered, what it meant to wrestle with scripture. Last year, we really doubled down into Oasis. God was calling us to deepen our commitment to creating safe space. And this year, our heart, our heart is for restoration because we believe this is the heart of God. Restoration is actually God's dream. And we know this from Genesis 1, right? If you've read Genesis 1 or heard it, everything was good and good and good and good and very good. Now, it's interesting because good in the Hebrew language, which was the language that Genesis 1 was written in, the Hebrew understanding wasn't sort of a, a quality of the product. Like, that was good coffee because it was dark roast and had three cream. That's not the description of good. You know, the beaks are straight on the birds and dogs don't lick your face because clearly something went wrong there. But good, good wasn't the perfection of the object. Instead, good was the quality of the relationship between the elements of creation. How creation works together, how everything fits together, the synergy of it all for the flourishing of it all. And we identified four areas that we felt needed to be focused on. There's probably more, but these are the four categories of restoration. First of all, people with God. Helping people to discover, delight in, and follow Jesus. And we're starting Alpha this week, and uh, it is a great experience if you are looking to just discover Jesus. Maybe you're just exploring faith and God and scripture and church and all that and it's a bit new to you, Alpha starts this week. And if you see anyone walking around with a yellow shirt, Sanders at the back, bright yellow shirt, you can't miss them. Uh, they will help you get registered. They'll tell you a bit more about it and so stop by and talk to one of those with the people with the yellow shirts. But, but Alpha is a great way to help you to discover and delight in Jesus. And also repairing our concept of God. Many of us had a concept of God that was other than Jesus. And so that was part of rest restoring people with God. We're gonna look at that. And then restoration of people with each other, right? Honoring the image of God in one another. Healing racial and social divides and forgiveness and reconciliation. That's another area we're gonna look at. Restoration of people with the created world. Partnering with God and flourishing our brokenness with creation. And then restoration of people with our bodies, leaning into inhabiting our, bo our bodies in a way that honors body, mind, and spirit. God came in the flesh, died in the flesh, rose again in the flesh. And God is passionate about, about restoring the whole person. It's important to God. And it might sound woo-woo to some of you. Others of you know you know intimately how connected our spirit and our body is, our soul and body and mind and emotions. We've had front row seats, haven't we? As Mark and Trifina have shown us how they have leaned in to this whole area of bodily restoration. 
So this year, this year we want to focus our attention collectively as a church, intentionally, online and in the building, on where God is inviting us to be restorers and rebuilders. And over the next four weeks, five weeks, we're going to dig deep into these four categories. We don't know yet. We don't know what God is calling us to as a church in the next year. But God is already planting seeds. Perhaps we don't see them. Perhaps we're just, we see them just sprouting up. But do we have the courage? Do we have the courage to follow God into what God might be calling us to as a church here at Lakeside? There's this passage in Isaiah. Isaiah was one of the ancient prophets of Jesus' ancestors. Arguably the most important prophet. Jesus quoted him all the time. Now when I say prophet, don't think Nostradamus or any of those people who you know, predict the end of the world and then when it doesn't come they predict it again and again. And again. That's not what I mean by prophet. A prophet in scripture is someone who's called by God to deliver a message to the people or to the rulers, generally the kings, to speak on behalf of God. So you can imagine this is a huge responsibility to speak truth to power and to the masses. And prophets were people who could read the times. They, could, they, could, they were the moral compass. They could kind of see the corruption of the systemic injustices behind all of the religious piety behind the religious slogans and the practices and the bumper stickers. Now, they weren't the most <clears throat> diplomatic of persons. I kind of like them. They, they, they just speak their minds. And here's one of my favorites. This is Amos. He lived in 760 BCE. The people weren't following God's ways. They weren't, they weren't living life as God intends it. And this is what he says. Listen to this, you cows of Bashan, grazing on the slopes of Samaria, you women, Mean to the poor, cruel to the down and out, indolent, I looked it up for you, it's lazy. Indolent, pampered, you demand of your husbands, bring us a tall, cool drink. <laughs> He's calling the elite women cows of Bashan. And here it is in our scripture. I'm not, I'm not recommending that you do that. Uh, but he would have fit well, well on Twitter, I think you'd agree. But we don't know actually if this phrase was an insult or whether it was just like a local kind of expression that described, you know, Kardashian-esque extravagant women. So we don't know if it was an insult or not. But anyway, he is calling them out for their lack of care for the poor and the marginalized. He's making his point clear. You are lazy, you are pampered, you are extra extravagant, there's a word. You have no care for the poor. In fact, you contribute to their misery. And most of the prophets were killed. They were stoned to death. You can kind of see why, right? <laughs> when you anger those with money and those in power, it usually doesn't go well. But back to Isaiah. He's bringing this message to the Israelite people who were self-indulgent, very much like the people that Amos was addressing. They were ignoring the poor. They were a community who thought they were so religious. They did all the things, the theological study, the prayer, the fasting, all the holy days, and the whole thing was a sham. It was a sham. They were outwardly pious and inwardly bankrupt. They weren't unreligious. They were hyper-religious, and they flaunted their piety. But they missed the whole point of God's compassionate justice. They disregarded the whole realm of economics and commerce. They gave offerings, but it was from ill-gotten gain. They went to church on Sunday, but exploited their employees on Monday, that kind of thing. And this passage clearly states where God's heart is. It's for justice and compassion. Listen to this, I'm reading from Isaiah chapter 58, starting at verse six. This is the kind of fast day, now a fast day is a, a form of worship. This is the kind of fast day I'm after, God is saying, to break the chains of injustice, to get rid of exploitation in the workplace, fair wages, free the oppressed, cancel debts. What I'm interested in is seeing you do this, sharing your food with the hungry. Inviting the homeless poor into your homes, putting clothes on the shivering ill-clad, being available to your families. 
If you get rid of unfair practices, quit blaming victims, quit gossiping about other people's sins, if you are generous with the hungry and start giving yourselves to the down and out, your lives will begin to glow in the dark. Your shadowed lives will be bathed in sunlight. I will always show you where to go. I'll give you a full life in the emptiest of places. Firm muscles, strong bones. You'll be like a well-watered garden, a gurgling spring that never runs dry. You'll use the old rubble of past lives to build anew. I love that. Rebuild the foundations from out of your past. None of it's wasted. God is going to renew it. You'll be known as those who can fix anything. Restore old ruins, rebuild and renovate. Make the community livable again. How earthy is this? How every day, every home, every budget, every people group, every family is this. This is how God defines worship. This is worship. We call this a worship gathering. It is. We call our singing worship. It is. But it's not isolated from the rest of life, from food and water, from homelessness and hospitality, from justice and victims' rights. Our attention to those things is worship. It's not one or the other, but it's both. It's integrated. It's what we do here. What we do here reorients us to God's heart, to God's love for justice and compassion. For out there, we are bombarded over and over again from Monday to Saturday, the whole rest of the week with messages of self-indulgence, of the lure of power and control and wealth. And we come here and we reorient ourselves to another way, the Jesus way. All of life for God is spiritual. In fact, there was no word in the ancient Hebrew for spiritual because all of life was spiritual. They saw body and mind, heart and soul as integrated. Making bread and saying prayers, it was all spiritual. Prioritizing the spirit over the body is a heresy that came into the church centuries ago and we have to rid ourselves of it. Body and mind, the whole person is what God is interested in. These are God's desires long before Jesus came and established the church. And Jesus didn't change it. He doubled down on it. He quoted Isaiah all the time. And here again, he's quoting Isaiah in Luke 4. You've heard it here. We've, we've, we've preached from it before. This is Jesus' mandate. And if it's Jesus' mandate, it's our mandate. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now there, the year of the Lord's favor, he had them right there. That is Bible speak. That is another way of saying jubilee. And jubilee was a practice that was baked in to the nation of Israel. It was a reset, an economic reset. Every 50 years, slaves were set free. Now remember, we are cheering for that, but remember, slaves were part of the economic engine. So if you were a wealthy landowner, this wasn't good news for you. You were giving up your means of production. It's the reason the state of Mississippi uh, seceded from the Union. At least they were honest about it. This is what they said. A blow at slavery is a blow at commerce. <laughs> a blow at slavery is a blow at commerce. So Jubilee was a reset, an economic reset. It was also debts were forgiven. They were completely canceled. Let that blow our modern capitalist minds. It was also land. Jubilee was land legally or illegally acquired was returned to its original owner. Now stop for a minute and let that challenge us as those who live and work and worship on indigenous land that was wrongfully taken. What does it look like? What does restoration look like? It's complicated. Jubilee felt like this for them. 
right? Just won the lottery. Not that I'm promoting lottery, but that's what it felt like. That's what Jubilee would have been like. Freedom, liberation, an economic reset. And this one practice was built into the fabric of Israelite life, and it protected families from permanent economic collapse. Wouldn't that be wonderful? It reversed the downward spiral of poverty and it interrupted the ongoing, untamed, rabid greed. And it reduced the causes of social conflict. We know poverty and high unemployment and food shortages erupt into violence. We've seen it, we continue to see it. And social unrest, and it's the ingredients for gang warfare. When the community doesn't flourish, the community ultimately pays. So imagine if we could just flip a switch. An elected official could say, I have the answer, and actually mean it. I have the answer. It's gonna solve all of this. They had it. History says they probably never practiced it. You think, why? Why wouldn't they have practiced this? It's kind of obvious, right? The ones with the wealth and the power stand to lose a lot, and they are the ones who wouldn't benefit. They are the ones with the power to enact it and they didn't. So Jubilee isn't good news for those with wealth and power, for the elite. If you've accumulated a ton of land over the years and you're respected and you're wealthy and you're a landowner, do you want to return land that you legitimately paid for? It's why it's so critical to train ourselves to read the Bibles with those on the margins because the Bible was written by the powerless to the powerless and to understand it in its context, we have to look at it through the lens of marginalized people. Jesus' declaration of Jubilee was a stunning and incredulous declaration of freedom. It was music to their ears. You see, these people <clears throat> were under Roman occupation, right? So to put it in today's context and language, we would say they were a colonized people. They experienced the first century equivalent of military checkpoints. They were unlawfully imprisoned, they were unethically taxed and impoverished, they were oppressed, and they were persecuted. And I mean truly persecuted. Not like we can't say Merry Christmas persecuted, right? That's not persecution. They were persecuted. And then it goes on, it says Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What could he possibly have meant by that? Their eyes were fastened on him. They're hanging on his word today. Really? He's gonna enact Jubilee today? It always began with the blowing of a ram's horn, a shofar, and so they're looking around like, who's got the shofar? Who's gonna blow this? And what were they imagining when they heard him say, today, Jubilee is enacted? Church services and angelic choirs? No, justice, liberation, freedom, flourishing. That's what they were imagining when he said, today. But what did he mean? How could he mean today? He didn't have the authority. They were under Roman occupation. So what was he saying? What was he saying? He's saying creation today is being reset. He was thinking way bigger than they were, way beyond this one people group. He's saying there's a new king in town and there's a new kingdom being established. The empire of Rome and any other earthly power is being subverted by a, a new, a different empire whose language is love, whose currency is compassion, whose symbol is a cross, not a sword. This kingdom is not an overthrowing kingdom. It doesn't come by weapons and lobbyists, but subverting, disrupting the reigning kingdom. It's kind of like a second operating system on your computer. You know, there's the main one and then there's one working in the background. But it's not a bug, it's to improve. That's the kingdom of God. Quietly, silently, working in the background to subvert the empire. And this kingdom, this kingdom was to be demonstrated by the church. By the church. You see, the church is supposed to be an outpost of God's dream, God's vision for all creation. People are supposed to look at the church and go, wow, 
That's what God meant. That's how life is supposed to be. Living proof as life as God intends it. And Jesus chose the word church very specifically to describe his movement. The word comes from the Greek word ekklesia, and it wasn't a religious word. Ekklesia was just a group of citizens called to affect the common good. <laughs> a group of citizens called to affect the common good. That's the church. That's the church. And these Isaiah passages were repeated by Jesus. They don't need fancy interpretation. You don't need fancy tools. It's pretty clear when you read it. You actually, if you're gonna get fancy, would be to spiritualize this. It takes fancy interpretation to squirm out of our social responsibility. Reducing Jesus following to simply believing and social compassion and justice to some kind of inner spirituality. Isaiah is clear, Jesus is clear. Compassion and justice are the heart of God and the mission of God. Another prophet synthesized it so well. God has shown you, O mortal, what is good. What does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? That's it. That's the heart of God. It's the will of God and it's the method of God to bring about a restored creation. And so back to my haunting question. If church is closed, who would miss us? Now, the church is more than an organization to do good, but it is not less. It's more than an organization to do good, but it is not less. The church is more than the Rotary Club, but not less, and no offense to the Rotary Club. They're actually involved in God's work without even realizing it. So that's a shout out to all Rotarians and Kwanians. Bless you for what you're doing. But as the church, we followed a crucified and risen deliverer. It means that our template, that's our template, that's our hope. Tim Keller has said, if the resurrection of Jesus Christ really happened, and we believe it did, then ultimately God is gonna put everything right. Regardless of how things look, as Rachel said earlier, God will and is putting things right. We don't make it happen, God does. We don't change the world, God does. But we partner, we partner with God in God's plan to restore all things. What a calling, friends. I love what theologian Stanley Harawa says. He said this, the primary task of the church is to make the world the world. <laughs> Our task is not to change the world. Our task is to be the world already changed by Christ. <sighs> the world already changed by Christ. Before the church sets out to change the world, we must be something other than the world. It means we don't power up or fight or lobby to force God's ways. We live it. We live it and we give it. Everything we do, the orientation of our lives is towards restoration, towards flourishing, towards wholeness in our inner being and our outward living. This is the heart of God. This is God's will. Isn't it beautiful then that Jesus asked us to remember him, not with vaulted ceilings and marbled cathedrals, though there's a place for that, not with impeccably choreographed church services and perfect sermons, thank goodness, not with onerous rituals or arduous fasting, but with food and drink, the ingredients for life, the stuff for the body. Remember me with elements that feed your body. Eating is holy, it is spiritual. And this table is a sanctuary where Jesus is present. In the Celtic tradition, they talk about thin spaces where you experience almost heaven kissing earth. For some people it's by a lake, other people it's nature. This table, when we gather for communion is a thin space. Heaven meets earth. Jesus promises to be present. 
Jesus chose these simple elements that were on every table. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. When you eat, remember those without. When you gather, remember those who are excluded, marginalized, wounded by the world and the church, those afraid to come in. See, at this table, Jesus is present. Heaven and earth come together in a mysterious way. Restoration happens. So I'm going to invite those who are serving communion just to come forward and <clears throat> take your places. I'm going to invite you to come and to join together in this simple practice. All, any, who are hungry for God, who are hungry for restoration, are welcome at this table. And if you need gluten-free, everything is gluten-free here. If you need assistance and you can't get up to come forward, just raise your hand and someone will bring it to you. And I'm just going to ask that as you come forward and you receive the elements, that you take them back to your seat so that we can all eat and drink together. And as you do, as you sit and as you ponder, think, what restoration might God be calling you into? Where is God calling you to be a restorer or a rebuilder? Or ask the Holy Spirit, what needs restoring in my life? What area needs restoring? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for this table, for these simple elements that represent the most profound mystery. Thank you that all are welcome at your table and that you've promised to meet us here. And so we pray your presence, your restoration, your healing, your presence as we receive these elements this morning. Amen. So come forward, there's a map on the screen and receive the elements and then take them back to your seat.